everyone for joining this webinar we are going to record this so we'll be sharing the recording with you at max by tomorrow evening indian time so don't worry if you don't uh, completely understand some parts or if you would want to recap of few portions we'll be sharing the recording with everyone so let's get started and if you have any doubts or questions i really encourage all of you to be very active on the chat because we usually clarify many questions through the chat itself. We have a Q&A section towards the end, but we'll be taking questions through the chat. So please try to be uh, proactive as the session proceeds and you can get your doubts clarified. We have conducted sessions on scientific machine learning previously. However, in this webinar, Scientific ML is in the second half of this webinar. In the first half, we'll be discussing about traditional machine learning and the approaches we can take and then i'll discuss why we should learn about scientific ml and how you can build your profile this webinar is perfectly suited for anyone who wants to transition to ml not specifically students or not specifically industry people anyone who is looking to transition to ml or build their profile in ml for upskilling for a job transition or just because you're passionate about it will find this useful so most of the experiences in this webinar are drawn from our personal experiences. That's why uh, people really resonate with these webinars a lot. Before we get started, uh, I would like to get a sense of the audience in today's call. So what I'll be doing is I'll be sharing this Google form with you. It's a pretty simple, a straightforward form with just four to five questions. And uh, I just want to know a bit about your field of study. So I'm just going to uh, tag everyone in the chat and share this form. Can you please fill this form as I proceed? What this will do for us is that uh, I'll get to know a bit more about your background in this call so that uh, we can tailor the webinar accordingly. Let's get started now. Uh, please fill the form as, as we speak. At least 100 responses should be there so that uh, we can tailor it accordingly to your profile. So you'll receive more uh, benefit if you fill your field of study, whether you are a beginner or an intermediate in ML, etc. Okay, so uh, let us get started with today's agenda. Today we have the following things planned for all of you. First, I'll start with my story, which we typically do in this webinar so that you get a sense of why we are conducting this webinar in the first place. Then we'll talk about the traditional ML route. We'll be sharing a very detailed document with you about the courses which you should take, the projects which you should be doing, the coding, maths, uh, tutorials, or the links which you should be looking for. Up till now, we have around six to seven years of experience in this field. So we have prepared a detailed document and we'll be sharing that all with all of you in this call itself so that you get the best resources. After the first part of the webinar is covered, we will talk a bit about what are the problems with traditional ML. So you can start with the courses and projects which we record uh, or which we share with you, but you should not stop there. That's the mistake which many people make when they transition to ML. You should do something else. And that is scientific ML that really changed my career. Many people are asking about the recording. And uh, as I mentioned at the start of the webinar itself, we'll be sharing the recording with everyone in this call. You'll get an email by tom tomorrow evening IST. So don't worry about it. Then finally, we'll also be talking about the scientific ML bootcamp. And then we have a Q&A section towards the end. As I mentioned, please use this webinar as an opportunity to get your doubts and uh, queries clarified and uh, put it in the chat. So let's get started. First is my story. So I actually graduated with a B.Tech in IIT Madras in mechanical engineering. And when I graduated, I had no clue about machine learning at all. I had not taken CS courses. I had not taken data science, data, data scientist based courses or even DSA. And I joined MIT with the hope of becoming a professor. So I had this dream of becoming a professor in mechanical engineering, but it all came crashing down in the second year of my PhD. So in the second year, I actually went to a career fair to look for job opportunities. And there I saw that almost 80 to 90% of the companies which had come for uh, placements, they were looking for some kind of machine learning experience. Even companies uh, which were traditionally mechanical engineering startups, they were looking for someone who has knowledge of mechanical as well as machine learning. 
so then that led to a career crisis for me because i had no knowledge of ml and i could see everyone around me talking about ml and so i just felt like an imposter at mit and i had thoughts of quitting mit at that time so i lost interest in mechanical and i switched research groups so it's when i switched my research groups that my transition started to machine learning i accidentally discovered a group in scientific machine learning uh, and that completely changed my life like i switched to ml in 3 years i published machine learning papers which now have 400 plus citations i defended my thesis uh, phd thesis at mit i also got multiple job offers without me reaching out to companies but companies reached out to me so the these are some of the papers i published at the end of my phd in machine learning so my topic was scientific ml applied to the covid 19 pandemic and we worked with governmental agencies a number of startups etc so all of you must be curious about this right how did i manage to switch to ml being a mechanical engineer and that actually is the origin story of this webinar itself so now i strongly believe that if i can make this change anyone can make this change this belief could not have happened in me if i had myself not made this change but now i'm pretty convinced that if you follow the path which i accidentally discovered many people or almost everyone in this call can transition to machine learning and in today's webinar i am going to share that path or share that road map with you so uh, how was this possible one myth which i want to break right at the start of the webinar is that earlier i used to think that i am not a computer science graduate i have not taken data structures and algorithms courses so i won't be good enough for machine learning i had this insecurity that ml is only meant for ca students uh, but that is absolutely not true i had no background in formal cs i did not take data structures algorithm courses neither had i taken any cs course in undergraduate i was a core mechanical engineer so ml is not only meant for cs students let me actually check the form which all of you uh, might have filled so 91 responses awesome guys thanks for filling this form so let us look at the fields of different people so in this call there are 26% of people in this call are mechanical engineers uh same for me uh 24% are computer science graduates and remaining i would say around 50% are a mix of electrical biological chemical physics material science economics business analytics biomedical engineering so for all of you who are not belonging to the cs field uh don't worry you can make this transition of course for all of you in the cs field if for some reason you also think you cannot make this transition don't worry it's possible for everyone to make this transition you just need to know the right path now let's see the ml knowledge so about 37% of the people in this call have beginner level knowledge and uh, i would say so overall i would say about 80% of the people have beginner to basic level knowledge and around 20% of the people have intermediate knowledge and two people in this call have advanced knowledge awesome so the webinar will be particularly useful to all of you i think and here i can see people have done entry venges courses half way through entry venges courses courses watched on youtube nptel that's great right so there is so much material out there that we all get confused what to do what not to do what is good what is not good i'll uh, share the good resources in this call also so no need to worry so let's get started now with the next part first myth which i want to break is ml is not only meant for ca students anyone can transition to ml all of you in this call can do this transition next thing is that uh, the webinar which we have constructed is not only meant for you to transition to research but it's also for people who are looking for job transitions so when i completed my phd in scientific machine learning people from recruiters from facebook amazon and julia computing reached out to me to uh, for machine learning engineer roles and i had not put my resume anywhere it just they found me on linkedin they looked at the projects which i had done so if your goal is for job transition or research publication or grad school for all of these the road map which we are proposing today will be applicable okay the first thing what any student does when they want to transition to machine learning is start doing courses right that's the first thing which comes to the mind of everyone great now uh, if you do any course in machine learning you can look about uh, 
all the courses they have certain things in common they teach you regression they teach you classification they teach you neural networks then they teach you unsupervised learning and they teach you reinforcement learning for example i am just sharing a link with all of you on chat right now uh, so can everyone just quickly take a look at this link this is if you click on the pdf of the course syllabus this is a free course and it's mit's machine learning course uh, all the course content here is offered for free i just want to take you through what they cover so as i mentioned here uh, they will cover regression classification neural networks unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning so see at the start they cover regression then they cover classification then they cover neural networks then unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning this is the same thing which is covered in almost all the beginner level machine learning courses uh going into it a, in a bit more detail usually machine learning is divided into three main buckets supervised learning unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning to all the beginners uh, in this call and i think there are 30 to uh, 40% people in this call who are beginners. Supervised learning is basically we tell the machine or we provide labels. We say that, hey, look, these are images of cats. These are images of dogs. I want you to build a classifier which can distinguish between cats and dogs. So we provide labels. That's why it's called unsupervised learning. Uh, that's why it's called supervised learning. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, does not come with labels at all. You just give huge amounts of data and ask the machine learning algorithm to, to let's say cluster into groups or form patterns. Reinforcement learning is a completely different thing. So you might have seen AI beating humans in the games of chess, alpha, go, etc. So these gamified environments uh, usually come under the bucket of reinforcement learning. That's why beginner level courses usually teach you about all of these three types. So linear regression is just basically fitting a straight line between the independent variable and the dependent variable. So think of predicting the housing price based on the area of the house. That is essentially linear regression. It's quite, uh, it's as simple as that. Then uh, logistic regression. So logistic regression is basically just predicting zeros and ones. It's, you can think of it as like a classification problem, right? Uh, that is essentially logistic regression. Classification is basically uh, making predictions as whether a brain tumor is present or absent, let's say, whether it's a cat or whether it's a dog. So bucketing into two types of divisions, that's classification problem. And uh, there is also one more type of category which is called as neural networks. And introductory courses also cover about neural networks. As you can see over here, the MIT's introductory course does cover a bit about neural networks in their unit 3. Some courses do not cover about this. But most of the courses cover basics of neural networks. And why do they cover neural networks? Because almost all ML applications which you see around you right now have neural networks at the heart of it. If you look at Alexa, if you look at Google Maps, uh, if you look at Siri, if you look at self-driving cars, neural networks basically power all of these applications. That's why it's important for you to learn about them. So uh, I showed you supervised learning, I showed you neural networks, and then there is one more type of ML, which is unsupervised learning. Uh, what happens in unsupervised learning, as I mentioned before, is that you just give data without providing the labels. Let's say this is the data, and you ask the ML algorithm to classify this into buckets on its own. So then ML, the algorithm does the classification, and it even determines the number of classes on its own. Then finally, reinforcement learning is a gamified environment, as I mentioned. Imagine you are playing a game of chess, right? Uh, so you have a state, you have an action, and you have a reward. So you have to determine your action accordingly to maximize your reward, let's say. That is reinforcement learning. This is usually uh, covered. These are the usual things which are covered in traditional machine learning courses. Now the question would be, and uh, I see many discussions on the chat also and in the forum, which course should I take? Usually in my experience, there are four good intro ML courses which you can take. And before going any further, let me share this, this document with you. This is the list of resources for transitioning to ML. Uh, and all of you will really find this very useful. So please uh, go here in the Chat. I'll just wait for some time until all of you have access to this. 
So uh, just make sure that you can open this document. Let me know if uh, it is not accessible for some reason, but uh, I think it should be accessible. Okay, so I hope all of you have received access to this document and it contains the entire list of resources which you need to transition to ML. So whenever I'm going through different sections as I proceed right now, please refer to this document uh, and you can click on the individual links. So when I'm talking about entry ONG course, click on this link. When I'm talking on about the Udemy course, click on this link so that you can follow along. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are four very nice uh, introductory level courses which I have myself found to be useful. The first is ML by Andrew Ng. Many of you are also discussing about this in the call. It's a it's a good course uh, for an introductory level. So let me actually take you through the course. The problem with this course is that it's really quite basic. They don't go into too much theory and they don't go into too much practical as well. So at a basic level, if you don't know anything about machine learning, this this is pretty good to start with. The Udemy course on the other hand is very, very practical and hands-on. It does not go into theory too much, but they have a lot of Python demos. This also, this course is fully free. You won't get a certificate for this free course, but you can do these projects. They have a lot of projects which they make you do in this, in this Udemy course, especially. This is also another good course apart from the Andrew Ng's course. One course which actually no one knows about really is that Kaggle has a very nice introduction to machine learning course. So I'm just pasting the link in the chat here. You can also access it through the form. Uh, just just, just check, check about this link. Not many people know about this, but of course Kaggle is a brilliant website for doing projects, right? But they also have courses. So this is a very nice course which they have divided into seven modules. How models work, basic data exploration, your first ML model, model validation, underfitting and overfitting, random forest and ML competitions. It's a very beginner level course, introductory level course, and you can also get your hands dirty by playing with the code. So just take a look at this. It's awesome. So as someone has asked on the chat, which, which one should you go first, Andrew NG, Udemy or Kaggle? So if you absolutely have no experience with ML, you can start with this course as the starting point. But I'm just going to tell one more thing right now. Uh, how many of you have gone, gone through our playlist on this machine learning teach by doing series? I'll just put this on the chat. This, this playlist did not exist uh, last year, but we made it this year and it has 37 videos. So I myself have recorded all of these 37 videos and it teaches you everything in a lot of detail about machine learning, about uh, classification, about regression, and about neural networks and about convolutional neural networks. So this playlist can be that one place if you want to really get started with. So uh, the problem with Andrew Ng's course is that it does not go into theory too much. The problem with, uh, sorry, it does not go into practical too much. The problem with the Udemy course is that it does not go into theory too much. This playlist which I have made, right, which has 37 courses, all of 37 videos, all of them are accessible for free. Uh, each video is around 40 minutes long. Whereas if you look at the course area, course area total length, it has 20, I think it has 16 to 17 videos and all of them are a bit short. But if you see, these are around 40 videos, which are 40 minutes long each. Some of the videos are even like 55 minutes and all. So it's, it's in a lot of detail and it covers theory as well as practical. If you are a complete beginner, this might be an awesome place for you to start learning about ML. Uh, so Rajat has also shared uh, this link in the chat. So please take a look at this and I would highly recommend even intermediate people in this call and advanced level people to check out these links because I have made them with a lot of passion and I am quite proud of these lectures, honestly. Uh, another set of lectures which I have also made related to deep learning is building neural networks from scratch. So this has 35 lectures. And it builds a neural network completely from scratch. Towards the end, you do your own hands-on projects also. So I'll share this link also in the uh, um, in the chat group. So playlist on ML is definitely for complete beginners. I don't assume anything. Everything is explained from complete basics. Even the neural networks from scratch series is for beginners, I would say. Uh, I even teach about dot products, the mathematics needed, the vector calculus, all of these things. Uh, so for learning about deep learning, this is an awesome series 
sorry for learning about machine learning this is an awesome series for learning about deep learning or neural networks the neural network from scratch is a very good series uh, and as sumita has mentioned deep learning is tough to understand right because it's not taught the right way the real way to understand deep learning is if you can build your own neural network from scratch how many people in this call can build their own neural network from scratch not only in this call but in the world really very few people can build a neural network from scratch and when you do that deep learning suddenly becomes easier because you understand the nuts and bolts behind how things are really working uh, so then and the third playlist which is there is related to decision trees this has eight videos so far and it will have around 20 videos eventually so take a look at the decision trees playlist also i have mentioned all of these links over here vijuara ml teach by doing neural networks from scratch and decision series so you should have these links uh, and there will be awesome links to get started one thing to all of you which i would like to mention is that when you start a playlist right don't stop halfway like you can see this right the first video has 14k views then it drops and uh, and the reason it drops towards the end is people just people don't show up if you don't show up then you won't learn one of the biggest lessons which I have in my ML journey is that you need to be persistent. Initially, things are interesting. So everyone watches initial lectures. But the people who really learn are the ones who stay with the playlist till the end and watch the entire playlist. That is where commitment comes into the picture. So passion is important, but it will wear off after the two or three initial lectures, right? You need to stay till the end. You don't need to leave courses halfway. Many people leave courses halfway. Uh, okay, so this is regarding courses and I hope you have understood. Uh, so these are legacy courses, Andrew NG's course, Udemy course, everyone knows about this. But some courses people don't know about is this Kaggle course and our ML course, Deep Learning and Decision Trees course, which I just showed you on our Vijuara YouTube channel. So this was just launched three months back. Uh, so use it to your full advantage right now. This is regarding courses, right? Awesome. Let's say some people have done basic level course, uh, but now what they want to do is actually they want to do some projects. So you can use Kaggle to start doing toy projects actually. And uh, Kaggle is an awesome place to start doing beginner level projects. So I've divided the projects here into regression, classification, natural language processing and reinforcement learning. Um, and let me show you the list of projects. So if you go here, you will see the resources for initial Kaggle projects, right? And let me show you these projects. You can first go to this housing price predictor. This is a very good project for beginners who want to understand regression. So one approach which I will strongly suggest is when you learn something in the lectures, try to go to Kaggle and implement a hands-on project. That way you will stay more motivated. So let's say for example, in this part, you understand linear classifiers. Let's say you understand linear classifiers and let's say you go through the regression lecture. Don't immediately go to the next theory lecture. Try going to Kaggle and try uh, solving or try doing this project on your own. The way you can do this is that you can just open it in Colab as I've shown you right now. Open this in Google Colab and then what you can simply do is that you can just run this Google Colab notebook right now over here. And that way, that's the best way to get started with ML and that, that's the best way to get your hands dirty. It's as simple as that. Just go here, click on uh, open in Colab this notebook will open in Google Colab and then start running the different code blocks and start running the notebook. That way you will have your first project already done in as you are going through the courses. The reason people lose interest also is because they think it's a lot of theory. But if you do projects and if you start getting results, right? If you start getting plots such as these, if you start seeing these plots, you will feel so motivated to keep on working. That's my approach for learning ML actually. My, I do not recommend doing theory for three, four months and then doing projects. I recommend immediately getting your hands dirty with projects. That's the easiest way to stay passionate and motivated. Uh, so now uh, someone has asked, do you need to really know how to blindly code without copy pasting syntaxes for these roles? Uh, okay, so I don't really understand the question. So the main thing is, for beginners, the you don't need to be intimidated by code. What you can do is that you can start understanding the different syntaxes in the code once the code runs, right? So let's say you run this Google Colab notebook and you, you start getting the figures 
and now you would be thinking that oh i don't understand some commands and how they work then you can go back to that particular command and then you can start understanding the command in detail that way you will learn and you will also stay motivated simultaneously so this is the first project regarding regression then regarding classification there is a good project which kaggle has which is called as digit recognizer so here what is done is that you have handwritten digits and the goal here is to recognize which digit is written over here. Uh, this is again an awesome project. Just open this project in Google Colab as I have showed you. Run this code and try seeing the classification for yourself. And once you start seeing the classification from for, uh, for yourself, you will see that, oh, I don't understand what is meant by uh, epochs or I don't understand what is meant by validation data. Now you also have chat GPT's assistance, right? So just go to GPT and then just, uh, just type it out there. Like what is meant by epochs? And then immediately you will have your answer right there and then. So what this will do is that you will not only get project results, but you will also develop your understanding about the code. This passion is very important. If you don't understand something, right? Don't just run the code and, and say that, oh, I've done this, I've run this CNN code, it's done. Try to understand every building block of the code and use chat GPT for help, use chat GPT for assistance regarding understanding of different concepts. Uh, great, so this is related to the classification project. Similarly, I'll show the disaster tweets project. This is another awesome project which can build your interest in machine learning. The main goal here is that uh, you have to do natural language processing with disaster tweets. So you have to scrape the data from Twitter and then you have to analyze the data and then you have to uh, do sentiment analysis. It's just an awesome project to build your intuition and understanding about machine learning. Same thing, go to Google Colab, run this code in Colab, try to understand the results, uh, go to chat GPT, ask chat GPT how this works, etc. So always try to have a good balance between the theory when you are learning the courses and these toy Kaggle projects. So as I mentioned, there is the housing price prediction for regression. Uh, then there is digit recognizer for classification. Then there is disaster tweets, natural language processing project. There is connect X. This is the project for reinforcement learning. Petals to the metal, another awesome project. I've given the links to all of these projects over here. So you will you will have access to all of these after the webinar ends. Now you all of you might be thinking in this call that okay, what about coding and what about mathematics? So when do I develop my understanding of coding and mathematics as I'm doing theory and as I'm doing projects? So parallelly, you need to master coding. And some of the good tutorials which I have come across are this one over here. This is a good one, Master Python Basics. Uh, it's a quick tutorial uh, for you to learn as and when you go. So click on this link, try to explore this tutorial. And the second tutorial is this complex NumPy. This is a Udemy course. And again, it's a free course. So many people have taken it and it has nice ratings. This is a good course to learn about the deep uh, deep learning stack in Python and uh, the different commands which scikit-learn offers. So if you don't understand any statement which is made here, right? Uh, in these uh, Kaggle projects which you run, just go to uh, this Udemy course which I showed you right now, this one, Deep Learning Prerequisites, the NumPy stack, and uh, develop your understanding. Uh, however, the way I did it when I transitioned to machine learning is I learned on the go. So my coding was not as strong as, let's say, other people. But what I did was when I did not understand something, I also tried to write it down on my own. So I, I learned coding while doing my projects. I did not specifically allocate time to learn coding separately, but I mastered it while running individual projects and that worked out really well for me. So this is related to coding. And then one more thing, which I also post a lot about this on LinkedIn is that you cannot really master the foundations of machine learning without understanding the basics of math. So there are really three fields in mathematics which you need to understand. The first is linear algebra, the second is statistics and probability, and the third is vector calculus. So I have mentioned about these uh, year also resources for math concepts. I'll add the uh, I'll add the vector calculus here. 
this is a live document so you can also access it after this call i'll add the vector calculus link over here again math is a kind of thing where i mastered it on the go so there are some things which uh, i was uh, weak on concepts like vector calculus was something which i did not understand too much so if you see this neural networks course i have actually vector calculus lectures see partial derivatives and gradient in neural networks and understanding chain rule the backbone of neural networks these two lectures uh, mention about vector calculus and they teach you about the basics of vector calculus i deliberately added these two lectures in the series because i know that for many students the concept of vector calculus still remains a bit weak uh, okay so this is related to the initial approach so just to summarize if you are a complete beginner like let's say in this form if you are a complete beginner of you or if you know the basics but if you are not sure whether your basics are correct start with these courses start with the ml start with this ml course start with this deep learning course and this decision tree course parallelly start with kaggle projects which i showed you download uh, open the kaggle project in google collab and start running the code once you run the code you will not understand some things use chat gpt to understand to hone your understanding about what is it that is not clear and parallelly try to uh, learn about coding and try to learn about mathematics so whenever you get stuck somewhere just become better and better and better it's an iterative process that's how i transition to machine learning now uh, this webinar would have stopped here if i would have taken a traditional machine learning path but i did not what i showed you up till now is just part one of how i built my machine learning profile what many students they do a mistake is that they just do until this part and they do some projects on kaggle and they add it to their resume this is not a sign of a serious machine learning engineer because think about it literally all people have access to these projects so everyone can do these projects and they can put it on their resume right so don't make this mistake of stopping right here and putting things on your resume you need to distinguish your resume from other students and let me show you a way to do that and how i accidentally discovered that so with kaggle projects you will start your ml journey and you will gain confidence in ml that's awesome right but the main issue is that kaggle projects first of all cannot be converted into research publications that's number 1 because they are not unique these are toy projects and everyone has toy kaggle projects they are not unique at all okay now how i made my transition to ml is that i accidentally stumbled upon a new field called scientific machine learning this field really launched 3 to 4 years back and now all of us in this call are at the perfect time to learn about this field 10 years later this will be saturated like natural language processing and computer vision so we would not have an advantage but right now the field is really picking up so we have an unfair advantage because we have identified the potential in this field early second i had the belief i could make this transition so first thing is that i discovered this field of scientific ml second is that i had the belief that i can make this transition why did i have this belief because i talked with the senior at mit and that senior convinced me that i can make this transition i was actually thinking of quitting so i hope this webinar serves as that belief to all of you who want to make this transition and third thing is very important is that i did not stop at projects i converted those projects into research publications so the reason why my profile became very attractive to job recruiters at facebook meta and julia computing is that i didn't just have projects on my resume i had i had converted those projects into research publications i waited for a long time to update my resume i did not update my resume until those projects were converted into publications so now let me talk a bit about what are the problems with traditional machine learning courses and why you shouldn't just stop at the first part uh why shouldn't you uh just stop at initial courses initial projects what is the need for scientific ml so here are the problems with traditional ml right uh let's take a look at this this course itself the mit course and let us look at the projects which they teach you throughout this there is a project on automatic review analyzer there is a project on digit recognition uh there is a project on collaborative filtering which is for giving reviews on movies let's say uh okay so this is awesome right there are these projects but these projects are toy projects 
Let me go through these projects again. So first is automatic review analyzer, digit recognition, collaborative filtering, Netflix movie recommendations, text-based game. Do you see the problem with these projects? Uh, let me go to the form which you have filled. If you are a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer or civil uh, biological engineer, computer science engineer, chemical engineer, how does doing a project on the review analyzer, how is it related to your field? How is doing a project on uh, digit recognition related to mechanical, electrical, civil engineering, fluid mechanics, finance? Not at all, right? These projects are completely tangential to your main field. They are not related to your main field at all. So then what that is why they are toy projects. Ideally, if you have spent so much of your time honing your understanding in these fields, ideally you should do projects which combine machine learning with these fields, right? That is actually the main spirit of scientific machine learning. In scientific machine learning, you actually combine your domain knowledge with machine learning. So these toy Kaggle projects don't show you how to combine machine learning with domain specific knowledge. That is number one. With these toy projects, converting these projects into research publications is not possible. And then final point, which is very important is without leaving your main field, whatever your main field is, you should be taught how to integrate machine learning with your main field. And that is when you will be motivated in your field. Plus you will see how ML can be applied to your field. This will also lead to projects which are new. So now imagine instead of doing those toy projects, let's say uh, you do these type of projects using machine learning to model COVID-19 infections in all regions of the world. Number one, let's say you do this, or let's say if you are a chemical engineer or let's say a biological engineer like i saw some people who have filled the form let's say you do a project which recovers chemical reaction equation just from the data using machine learning concepts or let's say you are a uh, yeah let's say you are a physicist and you use machine learning to predict black hole dynamics or i saw many people in this call are from finance economics or data science Let's say you are taught how to use machine learning to predict economic market forces like supply and demand, how to use ML for finance and data science. Um, let me, I think my screen sharing is paused. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or let's say if you are in biochemistry, you use machine learning for biochemistry related problems. Or I saw that many people in this call are from fluid mechanics, right? What about you use machine learning to analyze fluid mechanics or climate related problems? Uh, so wouldn't that be awesome? Because then these projects will teach you how to actually uh, combine machine learning with your domain knowledge and then these projects will be more related to your field also and not just that these projects can be converted into research publications because they are new not many people will have these projects on their portfolio these are new projects they can be converted into publications and you can have them as unique points on your profile not just that you will not have to leave your main field Machine learning won't seem something like in a completely different field for you. You can combine it with your main field. So if you learn to do such type of projects on your own, you will have a strong foundation in machine learning and how machine learning can be integrated in your own field. You can also convert these into papers and add them to your CV. This is actually exactly what I did. I did a scientific machine learning project related to COVID-19. And uh, I added that to my resume after it was published. So this is the path which I followed. I did not add the traditional ML projects on my resume. Rather, actually this project which I showed over here, right? The COVID-19 project. This was the project which I did uh, during my PhD. And I converted this into a publication and then added it to my uh, resume. Okay, not just that, uh, there are many professors in the world right now who are actually looking to work with scientific machine learning students. 
and there are not many students who know about scientific machine learning so if you work on these projects you can even email professors in this field and start projects with them it could be an awesome opportunity for upskilling really okay now uh, let's go to talking about what exactly is scientific machine learning so i can see a bit of uh, questions in the chat about uh, how to apply ml or scientific ml to your own domain right so i'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this field i'm just going to give you enough knowledge so that you know how scientific machine learning can be applied to your field so i can see that there are questions about manufacturing and production background economics and finance background uh, cryptography all of these are awesome fields to leverage scientific ml methods so this section which i'm going through right now will be particularly useful for actually everyone in this call so essentially scientific machine learning is the branch of ml which combines ml technique with your domain knowledge what do i mean domain knowledge the core field which you belong to all of uh, all of these fields which you see in the in this google form all of these fields that's your domain knowledge scientific ml is that branch of ml which combines ml with your domain knowledge that's number 1 so why why has this field really picked up so much so traditional ml is like a black box it is not really interpretable at all which means that you cannot ask questions to this black box why is it working you don't usually know things work very well but why they are working we are not sure scientific ml is like shining a torch on this black box we ask questions like why is this working and we get answers to those questions that's why engineers like us really like this field of scientific ml so the main thing in scientific ml is that we combine the power of neural networks with the interpretability of scientific structures and what do i mean by scientific structures i'll get to that in a minute but right now just remember we will combine neural networks with scientific structures and uh, all of these fields which i have shown on the screen and all of the fields which were there in that form scientific ml can be applied to all of these fields all you need to identify for your field is that what is that scientific structure and so first let me come uh, to scientific structure and what it means so here is my advisor dr chris rakaukas uh, who is the leading researcher in sci ml in the entire world so he defines scientific ml as model based data efficient ml so for traditional ml you need huge amounts of data right but for scientific ml you have the model you have the scientific structure so you have some physics knowledge which you already know so you don't need that much data that's why it's called data efficient ml so scientific ml uses both data and domain knowledge now let me come to what scientific structures mean so first of all can everyone put in the chat how many of you know about ordinary differential equation or partial differential equations okay so i can see that uh, many people know about odes or pds that's actually really awesome because it makes my job easier in the rest of this uh, in the rest of this section right so if you guys know about odes and pds all you need to think about is that in your field is there any ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation and uh, usually there is one even if you don't know about it and if if it exists you have you can construct a very you can construct an awesome scientific ml problem so uh, let me just quickly explain what odes and pds are for those of you who don't know about it basically an ordinary differential equation can just be thought of as a rate of change of a quantity let's say if you have invested in nvidia stock like i had invested but now it's going down right so its rate of change of if you want to quantify the rate of change of the stock this can be written in an ordinary differential equation the simplest way to think about odes is newton second law f equal to mass into acceleration we all know this right and acceleration is d square x by dt square so this is again the rate of change so this is also an ode these odes show up in so many places in biology and ecology there is this logistic equation which models the population growth in time right so the rate of change of population dp by dt this is an ordinary differential equation because it explains the rate of change now uh, one more higher level to the ordinary differential equation is partial differential equation so in ordinary differential equation there is usually only one independent variable time in partial differential equation 
there are usually more than one independent variables. So how many of you know about the Navier-Stokes equation? Can you just put it in the chat? If you have heard about Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, okay, so as I assumed, many people know about Navier-Stokes equation. It shows up literally everywhere around you. If you don't know about it, it's fine. I'll explain it to you right now. Basically, you're, you're sitting in a room right now, right? Watching this webinar. So the air is flowing around you. The flow of the air or the flow of any fluid is represented by Navier-Stokes equation, which looks like this. So du by dt is the rate of change of velocity with time. And look at this operator. If someone knows about this operator, can you type it in the chat? What is this operator? Uh, what is it called? Uh, if you don't know, it's fine. So it's the del operator as a, or the gradient nebula. All of these delta gradient nebula, it's all of you have mentioned it correctly. So this basically quantifies the change of the velocity in space. So this is du by dx plus du by dy plus du by dz, right? So here you can see that the velocity varies with time as well as with space. So there are more than one independent variables and that's why it's called as a partial differential equation. Awesome. So I hope everyone, all of you are with me until this point. Now, if you know about ODEs, PDEs, I'm going to show you a practical example of how scientific ML can be used to formulate a problem and then to convert it into a research project. So if you follow along in this part, you will, you just need to think after this webinar, how can I apply the same steps to my field? And then you can start working on your SciML project. So let us look at how to construct and solve a scientific ML problem. Okay. So I'm going to immerse all of you in an environment right now. And I'm, so the environment is that all of you are in a forest and there are predators and prey, right? So let's say there is foxes and there is rabbits. And if a bunch of foxes and rabbits interact with each other, what do you think will happen to the population of foxes and the rabbits? Uh, you might think that, okay, the foxes will just eat all the rabbits, right? Well, it's not as simple as that because if foxes eat all the rabbits, foxes have nothing to eat. So then the foxes population will also continue decreasing. So what actually happens is that the population of rabbits and foxes or wolves continues to oscillate. So when a bunch of rabbits and wolves or foxes interact with each other in a forest or they're put together in a forest, the populations oscillate like this. Increase, decrease, increase, decrease. This is the population oscillation in rabbits and wolves. This is also called as the cyclic dance of rabbits and wolves. And this is usually represented by the set of ordinary differential equations. So dx by dt is the rate of change of rabbits with time. And of course, it depends on the rabbit population, but there is an interaction term here, see, x into y. So this is the interaction term of how rabbits and wolves interact with each other. Similarly, the rate of change of wolves depends on the interaction term, and it also depends on the wolf population. When you solve this ordinary differential equation, you get results like these, right? Now you might be thinking, this is cool, but where is the scientific ML problem? So let's do some scientific machine learning magic now. Imagine you are a wildlife photographer. So if all of you, let's say you are a wildlife photographer and you have been tracking rabbits and wolves and you get an underlying data set, which looks something like this. You observe the cyclic dance of rabbits and wolves. Uh, and you have seen these oscillations in the population. That's great. Now you, you take this data to your supervisor, but the catch is that you do not know the underlying equations. In particular, you do not know the interaction term. So this is the underlying ODE, right? But let's say you don't have this full equation with you. You don't have these interaction terms. You only have a part of this equation. So let's say you have collected this data of rabbits and wolves and you have taken this to your supervisor. And uh, then your supervisor tells you that, okay, you don't know the underlying ordinary differential equation. That's fine. What if you can recover these missing physics using the data which you have collected. Let me repeat that. You have collected data of rabbits and wolves as a function of time. And you have this incomplete ordinary differential equation. Using that data, can you complete this ordinary differential equation? Can you discover the missing physics? Can you discover the missing interaction term based on the data alone? This is the main scientific ML problem which is asked in so many fields. In many fields, ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations are incomplete. You do not know certain terms. They are only approximations. So if you don't know missing physics, you can approximate the missing physics by neural networks. 
So what you will do at this stage is that you will replace these interaction terms with a neural network. And since you have already collected the data, you will train this neural network on the data. You will optimize the parameters of the neural network and then you will discover the interaction terms from the data alone. Just from the data, you will discover these interaction terms. You will discover that it's a product between X and Y. Isn't that awesome? Because someone has come up with these terms, but let's say you did not know these terms. Just based on data and the power of neural networks, you can discover the missing physics on your own. So let's say you are discovering new materials and you don't know the underlying physics completely. You can replace the parts of the missing physics with a neural network. Or let's say if you're modeling black hole dynamics, right? But you don't know the full physics. You only know the Newtonian part of the physics. You can replace the parts which you don't know with neural networks and try to approximate the neural network from the data alone. That is all which is done in scientific machine learning. The concept is very simple and it can be really applied to so many different fields. So you first identify parts of the ordinary differential equation or partial differential equation which are missing and you then replace these missing parts with the neural network and then you optimize the neural network. This is exactly what is done in so many scientific machine learning research problems. And if you understand this main philosophy, you will really understand how to build your own problem. So Aryan has asked, can you elaborate how you integrated neural network? So what is done is actually neural network is initialized randomly, right? And then the parameters of the neural network are optimized using gradient descent. We have a separate webinars every month on scientific ML. This webinar also we are this month also we are conducting a scientific ML webinar. In that, maybe I'll go through more details. But right now I just want to give you a flavor of what is really done so that you briefly understand this field and how you it can be applied to multiple fields. Now I want to show you actual research papers which are published in the field of scientific ML. And I want to show you that they are essentially doing the same thing. They take missing physics and they replace it with neural networks. So here is a paper on civil engineering. It's a 36 page paper. So other people who are not aware of this will not read this. But I want to quickly show you one thing. Just look at this. They usually start with a set of ordinary differential equation. And then they, so this, this is a linear term and a non-linear term. And this is the term which they don't know. So they will replace this term with a neural network. That's all they have done. So they replace the term which they don't know with a neural network and they recover it from the data. This is in the field of civil engineering. There is an awesome paper in the field of battery degradation. Again, it's 30 page paper, right? So you might think I cannot understand it, but again, look for the ordinary differential equation. So scroll down and you will usually find an ordinary differential equation like this. So take a look at this. These are the set of ordinary differential equation, which these people are using. And then what they do is that they see, they replace the terms which they don't know with a neural network. That's it. So they have a mechanistic term. So they know these terms, but they don't know this non-mechanistic term. They will replace it with a neural network. And once, and then they recover those neural network. So if you belong to whichever field you are in, I just showed you right now civil engineering and I showed you one from battery degradation, right? If you are from any field right now among these, you just need to identify ODEs, PDEs and replace them with neural networks. Let's say you are belonging to chemical engineering or biological science, right? Around 12 people in this call. So these are chemical, this is a chemical engineering scientific ML paper. Look at what they have done. It's pretty simple. They start with a set of ordinary differential equations. So let me show you those ordinary differential equations first. Yeah, these are the four ordinary differential equations they start with. And then they replace the terms which you which they don't know with neural networks. That's awesome, right? Uh, and then they convert it into a publication. So I was in the field of computer science. So I actually did a project in epidemiology, COVID-19, which no other CS student had. That made a difference in my profile. So if you are a CS student, just identify ODEs or PDEs in impactful problems around you such as pollution, global warming, climate science, and do that project. It, it also comes under machine learning. So you can term it as a CS project, like how I did, and then you distinguish yourself from the rest. So I was a CS engineer and Meta, Amazon, Julia Computing reached out to me because of this project, because no other CS engineer had a project like this. Uh, Sridhar and Rajat will cover this part in a bit more detail.
okay so up till now hopefully i have convinced you that scientific ml as a technique can be applied on a wide range of fields and in this resources to transition to ml i have also added the links to the scientific machine learning papers which i just showed you right now now uh, all of you might be thinking all of this is fine but if i really want to learn about scientific ml where should i go what should i do so this year we have launched this scientific machine learning boot camp i can already see many people in this call who are a part of that boot camp so i'm just uh, sharing the link of this boot camp with you here as i'm speaking go through this boot camp let me first take you through the boot camp content in this boot camp we teach you everything about uh, running ordinary differential equations in julia partial differential equations in julia physics informed neural networks neural ordinary differential equations we will even do two research based projects covid 19 infection prediction using scientific ml and black hole dynamics project using scientific ml the projects look like these so these projects will not be found anywhere else on the internet only people enrolled in this boot camp will be able to do these projects and add them to the resume this is the black hole modeling project this is a physics informed neural networks project so we'll teach you all of these concepts of scientific ml and if you want to publish a paper in this field right there is a researcher plan so if you really want to publish papers then we will work with you in your field to publish a paper in scientific machine learning in your domain if you don't want to do research just want to do this course understand the basics you can go ahead with the student plan and the community plan i think these things will really help you a lot but if you have been curious about scientific machine learning in this webinar please go through this link check out this material we have made this with a lot of passion uh, we have made this over a period of 8 months uh, and it covers all the teachings from mit i have shared the link to the boot camp in the chat for everyone wishing to take a look but take a look here so mit professors have also contributed a bit to the content itself uh so it took a long time to develop this boot camp and it's the world's first scientific ml boot camp um so you can go through these courses to do toy projects if you want but if you really want impactful projects here is an option for you to start doing it with us one more thing you must have noticed that i mentioned the julia language here right so how many of you have heard about the julia programming language uh i am not sure many people know about this language itself but it's an awesome new and a very modern language and it's the best language for scientific machine learning i'm sharing the link with all of you in the chat right now uh, we will be teaching you everything about this language itself i did my entire phd in this language so we'll be using the julia programming language to do all the projects in fact when i did my phd uh, this was the group i did my phd in the julia lab at mit where the julia language was actually invented Uh, so i was lucky enough to transition to this group during my phd and all my learnings from this group have been essentially condensed into this boot camp we have also mentioned the link to this boot camp i think over here so you will get all of it in the document and we have also mentioned some other resources to scientific ml methods so i think that brings me to the end of my part and now i'll stop sharing my screen and rajat and shridhat will cover the latter portions of the webinar Yeah, let me start sharing my screen. Just a minute. Yeah. So first, I wanted to discuss about uh, this conference, which is called Julia Con, and uh, every year they have a conference about uh, new developments in Julia. So I encourage all of you to. Uh, and and they release their conference talks on youtube and they have several talks in the field of scientific machine learning so you can just go ahead and uh, look at the youtube talks uh, in uh, which are presented in julia conference regarding scientific machine learning but for now i wanted to show you uh, this application of sciml uh, which was uh, actually combining dr raj's initial uh, project in his first lab which he switched and he moved to the uh, laboratory in the c sale department at mit and uh, the whole experience of of his is actually quite interesting because uh, he was there for two years or two and a half years in the first lab and uh, that work was actually very interesting and about to get published 
and at the same time he was learning about scientific ml and uh, like many of you i'm sure in this call he wanted to apply this to the field of fluid mechanics and especially the problem which uh, he was studying at that time and no one had had done that before which is the case with uh, with many other fields uh, people have not applied machine learning to actually study the fields in more detail because usually what used to happen at least one two years back was that there were uh, these two camps of people in the first camp people were uh, the ai skeptics they believed that uh, ai is just like a black box who is uh, which is like a function approximator it has no connection with real physics so what is all the hype about it is all uh, just some uh, short term hype which has no consequences in the future and then there was this second group of people who who believed that uh, ai can actually uh, merge with physics and they can make a lot of impact but they did not really have a lot of examples to show for it so that's the reason why the field of sciml has really emerged to kind of uh, integrate machine learning with physics now this project was uh, understanding splashes and uh, we encounter splashes uh, almost every day in our daily life uh, imagine that you have a cup of coffee or, or a cup of tea and you drop something on that so there is a, there is a very specific shape of liquid that is formed above the cup so so on the left you can see here there is a specific pattern right which is called as a crown because it looks like a crown that uh, usually a king wears and and this is called as a crown pattern uh, you can see splashes uh, when a uh, people swim whenever there are uh, the rainfall uh, falls on the leaves of a plant etc um, and and whenever it's raining very heavily if you put your leg uh, uh, very firmly on a on a puddle of water you can suddenly uh, see some splashes uh, on the road as well now the target of uh, this this problem was basically to study the splash problem which has historically been uh, very popular because it it's not easy to visualize uh, the splash problem and people have been uh, using microscopic imagery to see how the crown evolves with time um, and uh, what dr raj uh, actually uh, focused on was can he integrate the field of machine learning uh, with the physical equations which people had already written for uh, splashes but they are not quite accurate and uh, he also wanted to uncover the physical terms by using machine learning so uh, that is how the problem was formulated and i will show you some of the results which are actually quite interesting so this is how the crowd uh, the splash actually looks like there are three regions there is a crown which uh, i told you which looks like a uh, like a crown of a king then there are these secondary droplets which emerge for, uh, from the crown and underneath the surface there is there is a cavity which is formed because of the water drop impacting uh, the liquid so what these people did was that in in his lab they uh, had an experimental setup that actually measured the height of the crown the width of the crown and and all the details and there are uh, these physical equations which are uh, used to represent the crown dynamics and and the main question that they wanted to ask was that can they use a uh, julia to learn about the crown splash and and by julia's differentiable programming ecosystem i mean can they use the framework of scientific machine learning to learn about the uh, uh, crown splash and as as dr raj was mentioning in the initial part of the presentation everything really boils down to ordinary or partial differential equations so here the differential equations is is represented in terms of this variable which is denoted by capital u and the equation simply stands for uh, u dash equal to some function of u which is a neural ordinary differential equation and this u is uh, consisting of three parameters the first is the mass of the rim the height of the crown and the velocity of the crown and then uh, okay so this is this blue curve is uh, actually the uh, the experimental data and uh, which is which is obtained from the experiments how how does the crown height evolve with time so naturally you can see that initially it rises from zero then the crown height reaches the maximum and then after that the splash uh, comes down 
and the red one is what is obtained uh, from the neural network. So initially you can see that the neural network is not really understanding the trend in the height of the crown, but then after uh, they integrate uh, the neural ODE in the system of equations, you can see uh, it actually does a lot better, which I think they have shown in the next graph over here. Yeah, so here, here if you see, uh, the neural network slowly starts to do better. Uh, quantitatively, it is still a bit off, but uh, qualitatively, it is able to predict the uh, the height, the evolution of the height and the trend in the evolution. And then slowly and steadily, as the neural network is trained, it, it starts to do better and better. And uh, this is the thickness which the neural ODE is actually learning with time. And the experimental is the red curve. So, so you can see that it's uh, here it's quantitative, uh, quantitatively also a bit closer to the experimental curve. And the theory also predicts something like this. So now, uh, previously people only had the orange dot and the green dot. They did not have the blue dot. But now you can actually you have the experiments, you have theory, and you now you have a theory which is better, because uh, previously the theory was you can see not at all close to the experiments. There was a huge gap. So the orange and the green curve have a huge gap, right? But uh, after using um, scientific machine learning, what we have seen that is is, is that this, this gap is bridged. So now uh, the trained uh, neural network actually performs much better than the theory. So in essence, what we have done is that what scientists have had been doing in the field of splash was that there was a fixed theory and no one disturbed that but we added neural network uh, terms on top of that and then we made uh, the theory much better so that it matched with the experiments in a better way so this was an answer to the people in the first camp the skeptics who thought that how can neural network be integrated with physics well it showed that it actually can and it it can help us understand the phenomena much better. So the trained neural network matches the theoretical and the experimental profiles reasonably well. And they actually got a scaling law which, which exactly matches the scaling law uh, from the theory, which, which showed that uh, neural networks can recover the underlying physics very nicely. So even if this theory was not known by using uh, or training a neural network uh, on an existing governing equation, we can uncover whatever the theory predicted before. So this, uh, this example really fascinates me because it, uh, it combines a problem which has been analyzed at least a century back with something that has been developed quite recently. And uh, it forms a unified theory kind of, it, it unifies the old theory with the new uh, machine learning approach. So I, I, I hope this is, this is motivating for all of you. And then finally, I want to share uh, two examples of uh, students who have been working in uh, in our bootcamp. Let me just recompile this. So what we do is that people who enroll with us in our researcher plan for the bootcamp, we typically write uh, research papers along with them. And uh, these people are, are complete beginners and, and, and they come to us saying that I'm, I'm very much interested. So for example, this student, he approached us saying that I am very much interested in the field of astronomy and how can I apply a machine learning to the field of astronomy. So then we started looking at a lot of uh, equations where we can use a scientific machine learning. And finally, we conversed upon this equation, which is uh, a very famous equation, which is uh, uh, the Chandrasekhar's white dwarf equation. And this equation formed the base. Now, this is the uh, only understanding about differential equations that is really required to solve this problem. After this, it's just about uh, um, adding some neural network uh, terms on top of this equation and, and trying to match the data that we have collected. But you can see this paper has shaped so nicely that we are very proud of uh, this work that this student has done because he came to us as a beginner and now in a span of three to four months, he has now written a very excellent paper, which is not there anywhere in the literature. So this paper is currently uh, submitted to one of the journals and we are very proud of uh, the entire writing style of this student and the way he has evolved with time. Similarly, there is another student uh, who is working not in the field of astronomy, but in the field of climate modeling. And climate modeling is a, a 
very diverse field as as you can imagine but now in this case we are working with this system of equations which are called lorentz uh, system of equations which are these I'll, i'll just show you yeah these are the system of equations and the beauty of these equations is that uh, they lead to some chaotic uh, chaotic motions so what do i mean by chaotic motions let's say i perturb this system by a small amount um the resulting outcome can be random depending on uh, how different the perturbations are so for example this is one rendering of of one of the output you can see that it's it's like a spiral pattern but every spiral is different that's why you can see multiple spirals being overlapped on each other now it turns out that the lorentz equations can actually describe uh, the thermal convection which can be used to predict the temperature very well so these formed the core equations and they were modified like this you can see here the equations are modified and there are three neural networks we have added nn1 nn2 and and nn3 the objective of this paper is that to train these neural networks so that they match the uh, underlying ground truth data so you might be wondering where do we collect this data what we do in some cases where the data is not available we uh, use the data which can be created by these equations and then we add a lot of noise to it so that it it matches uh, the real life data whereas in some cases where data is available we just take the available data and here also there is a lot of hyperparameter tuning that is involved in this process this is where the main main learning curve lies and the satisfaction lies in the way that you have not solved a like a toy problem anymore but now you have linked it to a real life problem which is what makes uh, this whole project and this paper very interesting and this paper is also we are planning to submit to a very good journal because there are a lot of research groups currently working in the field of climate modeling and uh, using uh, scientific machine learning or physics informed neural networks to gain a better understanding so uh, i believe that as a uh, as a society and people who are doing research in ml we are moving in a direction where machine learning is starting to get combined with uh, with physics more and more we are no longer in the domain where people think that oh this is just a black box and a function approximator so what's happening inside the black box now we are slowly uncovering the layers one by one and we are trying to understand exactly what is happening inside so this is all that will uh, be the benefits of the scientific machine learning uh, boot camp and especially the researcher plan where we'll be focusing on the research project with you with an objective of uh, of publishing the paper at the end of it and uh, you can choose your field you can pick your field and then we'll work with you uh, to uh, to publish this paper so uh, i'll i'll stop sharing my screen now and dr sridhat will actually talk about the last part thanks rajat in the same line that rajat was talking about i want to talk about two papers one is an already published paper it's a very famous paper by uh, raj that was published in the journal cell patterns i will walk in detail uh, through this so that you can get an idea how to apply the scientific machine learning framework to actual real world problems but before that i just want to show another paper so this was written by uh, one student uh, and uh, you should guess his age he is currently studying in 11th standard so this was the battery degradation paper that he is currently submitting to uh, a conference happening at mit called mit urtc so uh, in this problem statement uh, just like how Ra rajit was talking about uh, collecting ground truth data here the issue was uh these days lithium ion batteries are uh, extensively used because of explosive uh, ev uh, market uh, explosion like the market cap of ev has tremendously increased but the problem is lithium is uh, not very easily available it's it's getting depleted and the only way in which you can sustain the growth of the market is to have very good um, lithium ion batteries uh, stability and longevity and this is characterized by something called a state of health so state of health degrades due to two reasons one is because the battery just because of time even if you don't use it it will continue to degrade and second if you keep keep repeatedly using it it's called cyclic degradation it can it can degrade its capacity so there are people who wrote papers about this with a lot of empirical uh, uh, equations so basically for any given battery you have to identify certain set of empirical parameters and there are many of them you can see this table a b c d e f all of these are empirical parameters 
and then you can come up with the equations for cyclic degradation and calendar degradation. But the problem with such approaches is that the degradation happens for these batteries over 5 to 10 years. So how do you actually conduct experiments for, let's say you have a Nissan car, uh, it has a certain battery model, you have to conduct long term experiments on that. Now you have Tesla, another set of long term experiments. So it's impossible to do this again and again and again for many different battery models. So a better approach would be, you could, you could try to frame this whole thing as a neural network plus equation framework. Don't, uh, don't worry if you don't understand this, but basically I'll come to this in more detail in the cell patterns paper. But basically here, if you look at this equation 8, this NN1 and NN2 are two different neural networks. And then you, uh, you model the total rate of uh, degradation as a function of the neural network plus rest of the parameters. So just like exactly what Rajat just mentioned, uh, it was very difficult to get actual experimental data from here, but we just wanted to show the validity of the scientific machine learning framework. So what we did is we tried to first create the ground truth data by first as assuming that, okay, we know the values of these empirical parameters either by taking uh, educated guess or by taking the values for one particular type of battery from existing literature and then plot the state of health as a function of time. So this is how state of health reduces from 100 percentage to 70, 60 percentage it can reduce over 10 years, right? And then what we do is, as Rajat mentioned, we add noise on top of this. So this is like a no Gaussian noise and then there is uh, the data will look like, you know, uh, it, it still follows a pattern but it's noisy. So this is how the, uh, how we construct the ground truth data and then we try to fit using various different parameters uh, of neural network, we try to fit how well the UD, the universal differential equation framework can fit the noisy data. And here you can see that the student, he is in 11th standard guys, you should, uh, if, if, I mean, he's a smart guy, I don't want to take anything away from him, but if he can do it, you can also learn these things uh, from scratch and do it. And I, I couldn't be more proud of a student who worked with us. So this is not like, this is not a extremely easy thing to do. We have had dozens of email conversations before reaching this point. But basically look at the fit guys it's amazing like the noisy data and the ud prediction um, is fitting really well and uh, there is also a forecasting uh, which is yet to be added but basically the idea is that the the neural network plus uh, differential equation framework which is the ud framework it can approximate it can really well learn on the training data but it can also forecast on the data really well on the data that it has not seen so i will come to that in a moment so uh, the last thing that we will cover in today's webinar would be this uh, cell patterns paper cell is one of the top three journals in the world uh, nature science and cell they are all in incredibly famous journals and patterns is one among the sister journals of cell so it's a highly reputed journal and when covid happened you guys might have seen in news articles one of the world's first machine learning models came out uh, for modeling covid and that was uh, by raj and dr chris rakaukas and professor george barbastasis all of them were at MIT and this is an interesting study because COVID when it happened, uh, there was already existing models for modeling this, uh, you know, uh, spread of virus and that was called as SIR model. So SIR is like S for susceptible, I for infected and R for recovered. So you take a population of 1000 people, you assume that if there is one infected person, this infected person and this infection can come from whatever bat or other animals or whatever. And then this one infected person can infect other people, right? So the number of infected people gradually increase. So infected people will increase from the susceptible people. So initially all 999 people are susceptible, then they become infected, then they will recover. A small fraction of them will die. So this was called as the SIR model, very famous model. It was probably uh, uh, you know, proposed almost a hundred years ago. Now, what is the relevance of SIR model in, during COVID spread? Uh, the relevance is there because some pa some parameters about the the actual COVID virus is known, like its virulity, like how quickly, how much time you have to interact with someone uh, who has COVID, certain variant of COVID. How much time does it take for from for, for it to spread from one person to another? And if there is one COVID infected person, on an average, how many other people will this person infect? All of these things were, no, were known and all of these things are mathematically uh, uh, expressible. So just have a look at the original SIR model, right? So susceptible people are the non-infected people who are still there in the population. 
So here there are three differential equations, equation 1, 2, 3 and each of them account for rate of change of S, rate of change of I and rate of change of R. So susceptible people, they are decreasing in number. But why? Because initially all the susceptible people, they are yet to be infected. But initially there are 999 susceptible people and then all of them become infected. So the number of susceptible people in decrease from 999 all the way till uh, whatever is the minimum value. So that's why you have a negative sign here. And the rate at which people will get infected will obviously be proportional to the number of people who are there in the population. So more, more populated, densely populated countries will have higher rate of infection. So that's why the ds by dt is proportional to s. It's also proportional to i. i is the number of infected people. If there are more infected people in a population, obviously the rate at which the number of infected people will increase will be higher. So if people are moving from s to i, meaning from susceptible to infected, the ds by dt should be a negative term. That is why this negative sign is there. Now what about the infected people? The number of infected people is increasing because some set of people are moving from susceptible to infected. But the number of infected people are also decreasing because some of the infected people are actually getting recovered. So that's why in di by dt there are two terms here. One is for uh, one is exactly same but opposite sign as that of the ds by dt. So you see there is no negative sign to this first term. The second term has a negative sign minus gamma times i. So here gamma is kind of the recovery rate. So higher the recovery rate, the faster people are moving away, moving from uh, uh, infected to recovered. And then finally, the rate at which recovered people are increasing. It's a positive number because people are recovering from initially being infected. And that is exactly this term, but with the opposite sign, right? So this was the traditional SIR model. Now the big problem with this, although this model was an incredible model, the problem with this is uh, when, when government imposed uh, quarantine, you could not express quarantine in terms of any mathematical uh, equation. Uh, Maybe Spanish government will decide that I am going to impose strict quarantine for 14 days and people should not even come out of their house. Maybe uh, US government might decide that, okay, quarantine, uh, I, we, are, we are having zones. There is red zone, yellow zone and green zone. In green zone, you are okay to go out. Red, um, yellow zone, maybe you can go out, but uh, only in staggered days. But uh, in red zone, absolutely no going out. So there are different degrees with which quarantine is imposed. And it's impossible to express this as a mathematical function. But what we do here is, in the case of quarantine, we, we define a fourth bucket. So initially there were three buckets, susceptible, infected and recovered. But when there is quarantine, we denote a, a fourth bucket called as isolated bucket or quarantine bucket. And that bucket is denoted by T, T of T. And the quarantine bucket will increase because the number of, if there are n number of uh, infected people, bunch of them will be quarantined, right? So the, the infected people, the rate, if the infected people number is very high, it means the rate at which quarantine happens will also be very high because if thousand people are getting infected, maybe the more severe ones might get quarantined fast. The other people who are not that that highly infected, maybe they are okay to not do the quarantine, right? So that is why this I of T times Q of T is there and Q of T is like the quarantine factor, quarantine degree of quarantine and minus delta times T of T. That is the rate at which people are going to, re to recovery from the quarantine. So you quarantine for 14 days or 21 days and then you are going from quarantine to recovery. So the number of quarantine people will decrease because people are recovering from being quarantined to going to the recovery. Now, what we can do is the Q of T, which is the degree of uh, quarantine, we cannot express mathematically, but we can express it using a neural network. I'll come to what exactly that means. You might be wondering what, do, what does it really mean to express in terms of neural network? Because isn't neural network like a bunch of inputs, hidden layers and output? Isn't that how it is? Yes, it is. Th that is how it is. But basically Q of T, will be the output of a neural network. What will this neural network look like? I will show you that in a moment. So now we have, instead of three set of differential equations, we have four equations. First is the susceptible. So susceptible will become infected, right? So there is no change in that because uh, initially there is uh, uh, people, to, people to move from susceptible to infected. They are just normally getting infected by COVID. Now, infected people are either directly recovering, right? 
so uh, so firstly di by dt has a positive term because susceptible people are moving to become infected then there are two negative terms associated with infected one is infected set of people can automatically recover so so that is the minus gamma times i so minus gamma i is the natural recovery rate but there is one more negative term which is minus q times i what is that that is a fraction of the infected people are also being quarantined right so that is the quarantine term so now we can write rewrite this equation by replacing q of t with the neural network so now look at this equation number 9 that is di by dt equal to minus beta si by n minus gamma plus neural network so when i say neural network you can imagine whatever is the output of a neural network that number that number is being plugged in here times i so that is the equation for rate of change of uh, infected people now uh, there is one correction in the recovered ter uh, term so in earlier the recovered term was whoever is getting infected they will eventually recover so dr by dt was just gamma times i but this times there is another delta times t so delta times t is nothing but people who were in quarantine they will also recover and they will move to the uh, they will move from the quarantine population to the recovered population so that is the next term and there is a fourth equation which is the rate at which the quarantine population is decreasing or increasing so that is the dt by dt that we already discussed so previously we saw here up here that the rate at which quarantine population was increasing was proportional to i and proportional to the degree of quarantine q and there is a recovery term which is delta times t so that the quarantine population is recovering and moving to the recovered population and now the, uh, the only change that we do here is the q of t which is the quarantine term be replaced by a neural network so now there are these four differential equations now what do we do uh, if you even if you did not understand this 100 percent if you have a 50 percentage understanding up until this point that is okay now just pay attention full attention in the next part because if you understand that you can you are pretty much ready to set up any kind of problem statement in a SciML framework so now you have these set of equations and you have a neural network right now what do we do here so what we do here is we know susceptible infected and recovered as a function of time how do we know that we know that because government has published data there were websites like worldometer.com there were many many websites in which susceptible infected and recovered this data was published so that assuming that as the input you can uh, train a neural network to predict a certain value of q so we said that the, the quarantine term q of t is the output of a neural network so basically this simple neural network with just one hidden layer uh, fully connected it could be fully connected or not uh, depending on what you want to set up but basically the input will be s i and r so if you if you add s plus i plus r you get the total population roughly some people are dying but we are ignoring that now using this sir data which is published in actual uh, uh, you know from covid data we can train the neural network to predict a certain value of q such that this q does something what is that something if you plug the value of q that is that you obtain here back into this these set of four equations wherever q is used right then you can solve these four differential equations to solve for s of t i of t and t of t and r of t so basically you can get values of s i and r back now what do you do you compare the calculated values of s i and r with the actual values of s i and r how do you know the actual values of s i and r from the actual published data so you compare with that value of s i and r and if the difference between computed and actual s i r values are very high then you have to uh, the, the loss term associated with neural network training is very high and uh, appropriately you have to adjust the weights of the neural network if the difference between actual sir and calculated sir is very very low meaning if they are very close to each other that means you have a very good neural network which can predict the degree of quarantine q of t with such a high degree of accuracy that if you plug that into q sir model which was the model that was proposed in this paper by raj uh, the QSIR model is now good enough for predicting the quarantine. Now, what, what does this mean in terms of actual results? Let's have a look at it. So here, what is being plotted is the infected and recovered population 
you don't have to plot infected, recovered and susceptible. All the three you need not plot because S plus I plus R is somewhat constant which is equal to the total population. So you just need to plot two of the items. The third, third one is known. So, uh, so here you can see that the actual data which, which are these bars and the predicted data which, are, which is the red curve or the blue curve for different regions are very close to each other for Russia, UK, Italy, Spain. And this is no coincidence. This is happening because the way in which we have set up the scientific machine learning framework. And this is for, this is for training. What about forecasting? You can also forecast on the future data set. So let's say you only have a uh, data of virus spread up till let's say 90th day. You can predict how much uh, if, if current level of quarantine is sustained, how much, how many deaths may happen or how many people may recover. A death is not part of this model or rather how many people may get infected that you can predict for the future. And here is another interesting thing. Can you predict from the Q factor that you that you calculate using the neural network? Can you predict which day was quarantine imposed in that particular location? That's an interesting question, right? Because Q of T we are producing out of nowhere. We are just producing it from neural network. Has it got any meaning? Can it actually mean something in the context of real quarantine happening in, in, in Russia, in, in, in Spain, China, etc. Indeed, it turns out that Q of T actually has meaning. So here what we are plotting is something called as the inflection point. So inflection point is the point at which the Q of T rapidly starts to increase. So if you note down uh, the, the point at which Q of T rapidly start to increase here, it is roughly like 18th day or something and here the the day, the time at which Q of T's inflection happens and the time at which government actually imposed lockdown in UK are coinciding really well with each other that you don't even see that there are two, two lines here. Actually, the green and red are coinciding perfectly in this graph. So you don't even see that there are two lines. And in many other places also that was the case. So for look, for example, look at the Spain. In Spain, the government, the, the Q of T predicts, the inflection point of Q of T predicts that the quarantine was imposed on roughly on uh, 11th day or something like that. The actual quarantine was imposed by the government on 10th day. Very, very good prediction, right? So this is exactly the power of uh, the SciML framework. And if you actually look at the actual strength of Q uh, or qu of quarantine for different regions. So here what we are plotting is something called as Q effective, which is the, the, the Q factor on the 30th day minus that on the first uh, Q of one, on the first day of quarantine. And if you plot the Q effective, you can see that uh, those regions with high Q effective value, which you can see in dark uh, purple color here, all these countries with, with dark purple were the, the countries with high Q factor, meaning uh, our model is saying that these are the countries with better quarantine measures implemented. Was that true? If you, if you actually look at the actual data, this green rectangle shows those regions with actually high or better quarantine and that was actually true. These, these green regions were indeed the ones that uh, if, you, if you look at the real situation in Europe, the countries that impose quarantine to, the, to be the strongest, these were the regions. So the Q factor could actually predict what was actually happening in the countries. We did not know, we did not know what the governments did. We only, know, we only knew S, I and R data from, from uh, internet. From that, we could predict how well the quarantine was getting implemented. So this is exactly how SciML framework works. The paper is very, very interesting paper. Uh, I am sharing the link to this paper in the chat. Just have a look at this. I'm sure all of you will enjoy. It's not at all a, a in, a, like it's 17, 18 pages, but don't get intimidated. If you, if you read it, if you spend a couple of hours on it, it's, it's a beautifully written paper. And in fact, we have a COVID mega project going on right now uh, in our uh, scientific machine learning uh, researcher. So the project idea is that we have already laid the foundation for uh, implementing SciML framework for different regions. But the paper was published in 2021 uh, or 2022. So after that, there has been a lot more data produced for many different regions, much more uh, uh, vast data. So there is a scope for publishing a huge paper that uh, extensively covers many different regions and uh, kind of uh, predicting predicting meaning learning on the training data and then forecasting 
that can be done for many different regions and it will be like a, a really really big paper and probably one of its kind uh, published for the first time in the world so uh, our plan is to include multiple papers as co-first authors in the paper so each person can take care of one region and uh, so let's say one of you is working on a uh, spain another person will work on china another person will be on india us so multiple people will be collaborating together on on this paper so if anyone is interested to be part of this as part of the siml researcher just just send us an email uh, of course these are ambitious projects we don't we don't want to you know um, um, do a lazy job and get something out there that's not our intention our intention to, is to send this out to the best possible avenues as for, uh, as much as we can so uh, two weeks ago we actually had a discussion on one of the papers its quality was so high we were thinking of submitting it to nature uh, but the problem was this uh, all of us have now graduated from uh, our university so we don't have the privilege of um, getting the university's funds for actually publishing in these journals uh, so there is something called as APC, Article Processing Charge. And for Nature and these big journals, it's like uh, $10,000, $12,000. It's like you can buy like a maybe a wagon or car with that. So uh, we were discussing that as the problem last couple of weeks back. So it's a good problem to discuss, right? Like at least at least we are aiming such high and our problem is more not about the quality of the work. It's more about how do we deal with the APC of these journals. But but it's an amazing, it's an amazing stage that we are at. So um, Hope you guys got some idea about the the siml framework as well as the whole traditional machine learning route why just doing toy kaggle projects is not the way to go it was the way to go maybe in uh, maybe in 2012 or 2013 uh, it would have worked out just doing andrew and ng scores would have been fine but the number of people who have done so many things is is so high in number that just just doing these toy projects do not work anymore so times have changed and you, should, you guys should also change so um, uh, if you have any more questions just feel free to ask in the chat or since we are already almost out of time just send, send us an email someone has raised the hand we won't have the provision to have uh, audio chat because it will take too much time uh, please send us an email and we'll uh, uh, we'll get back to you any last last remarks raj or rajat yeah, I think we are almost 10 minutes past time. So thanks to all yeah. for staying. Thank and you, everyone. Every month we will be conducting two such webinars. So we'll conduct a SIML one more webinar this month. And uh, we'll see all of you guys in that webinar also. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, yeah, have a good night. Bye.